Welcome, Marina Vyazovska, to the Land Windberg Distinguished Lecture Series today. Uh, so our speaker, Marina Vyazovska, earned her doctorate from the University of Bonn in 2013 under the direction of Don Zagir and Werner Müller. And um, then she spent uh, Sometime as a postdoc at uh, Berlin Mathematical School, the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, and at Princeton. And now she is a full professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. In 2016, she uh, obtained uh, now very well known results about sphere picking problem in dimensions 8 and 24. And since then, she, she's received a few prizes that work, including the Salem Prize, the Clay Research Award, the Sester Remenugian Prize, the European Prize in Combinatorics, um, the New Horizons Prize, uh, Ruth Little Sater Prize, the Thermo Prize, Lapsus Prize, and recently the EMAS, the European Math Society Prize in 2020. Uh, so today, Marina will speak about the sphere picking problem. Uh, so, uh, Sasha, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a big honor for me to speak at this distinguished lecture series. And today we'll speak about the sphere picking problem. So. Uh, but today I will not speak about, uh, or will very little speak about dimensions 8 and 24, and will rather uh, focus on some other aspects of sphere packing. So namely on uh, uh, existence results for sphere packings. And so uh, but let's start with the uh, basic definitions. So let X be a a subset of a discrete Euclidean of a discrete subset of the d-dimensional Euclidean space, and we choose uh, the subset so that distance between any two distinct points of X is at least two. And so then uh, the sphere packing. It's uh, just a union of uh, non-intersecting unit Euclidean balls. So here B is an uh, open ball with center X and radius one. And so whenever we have such a sphere packing, then what we can do, we can define the density of this packing. And so the density of a packing is defined as the volume of the of all balls in the packing divided by the volume of the median space. Uh, but here, of course, we cannot define uh, our uh, density exactly uh, like this. Uh, because this number is infinite and this number is infinite, so we have to be a bit smarter here. So what we do, we are taking the limit supremum over R goes to infinity. So now what we do, we will intersect our packing with a big ball centered at zero. So it will have a center zero and radius uh, R. Uh, 
And then divided by the volume of such a ball. And then this number will be indeed good defined for all uh, packings. And so now the number we are interested in are the sphere packing constant. Which is given as the uh, supremum of uh, all over all possible packings in d-dimensional space, and it will be supremum of their densities. And so here is one uh, interesting fact about sphere packings is that this. Uh, supremum uh, density, it is always achieved. So it's, uh, we will uh, always have a, a sphere packing such that uh, this limit, it's not only a limit supremum, but such a limit does exist. And this limit will be equal to the uh, 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 sphere packing constant. So here is the So what we can do, we can also hear the old theorem. So that uh, there exists a sphere breaking. star and so it will exist for each dimension d we will always have a sphere packing which achieves the optimal packing density and so for this packing we somehow all this the volume of Are intersected with actually here we can intersect it not only with ball with center at zero but actually with the ball with any center and so this will be true for all Points in the Indian space. And so, of course, knowing that we have a, a dense and yet regular sphere packing, so quite regular sphere packing is nice, it's nice, but it doesn't, this theorem does not tell us much about this question, the sphere packing constant itself. So let me uh, briefly uh, state what do we know at this moment about the sphere constant, sphere breaking constant delta d in different dimensions. And so let me make a table dimension. And here hey, Marina, can I ask a stupid question? Uh, is it known anything about B star being unique in some sense? I mean, obviously there's translation, rotation, things like this, but can there be radically different ways, hypothetically? Yes, and I will actually, now I will give examples of exactly what you're talking about. So it, this uh, phenomenon, it happens even in small dimensions. 
Great, thanks. Actually, even in dimension three. So I will come to it soon. So, so what we know about sphere packing. So, okay, so we know packing in dimension one and dimension two, and it's boring. So here, of course, in dimension one, the sphere packing constant is trivially one. And in dimension two, we know that sphere packing constant is this number. It is about 90%. And it is achieved, for example, uh, this is not for example, it is achieved by an A2 lattice or the hexagonal lattice or regular triangular lattice. And this is also a quite old result. And the proof is rather, rather simple and pretty geometric proof, which was uh, probably written in more or less modern language and by the modern rigor standards by Feyerstoff but was also known uh, since the beginning of 20th century. And so for here, the situation with dimension three is very different. So here in dimension three, we know that the sphere of picking constant is about 74%. And so the sphere of picking constant in dimension three, it was famously known as a Kepler's conjecture, which was resolved by Thomas Hales. Really at the end of the 20th uh, century. And so uh, what can we say about uh, dimension three? It's that in dimension three, we have actually uncountably many equally de dense uh, configurations. So here one uh, solution of this problem is the FCC lattice, phase central cubic lattice. And also this, uh, Density is achieved by the hexagonal closed packing. And so uncountably many other geometrically different configurations. And so how all these other configurations, how, how all these configurations can be obtained? They can be obtained by uh, tessellations of uh, A2 lattices. So we can take this two-dimensional solution uh, and here like every disk in this uh, solution, we are replacing it by a ball in three-dimensional space, but they're all lying in plane. And now we are trying to put such a planes one upon each other. And one can see that geometrically at each layer, we have actually two different possibilities uh, where, where we can put the, the new layer. And uh, yeah, so then depending on our choices, we can create uncountably many geometric, geometrically different configurations. And so in dimension four, it's the first uh, unsolved case. So here we don't know what the, uh, the exact answer is. So uh, I'm sorry, out, yes? of all, out of all those configurations, uh, of course, there are some which are periodic and which will have some some extra symmetry. And mm -hmm. how much are they which have a symmetry, a rotational symmetry? So how how many uh, will be lattices which are um, isotropic in some sense? Uh, probably with lattices, probably there are not that many. Yes, yeah, so here I'm not sure, but I think this, uh, I think there's HCP, it's also a lattice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I think these are the only two. But, yeah. Okay, so the only two possibilities For of having a group. Okay, but maybe I'm, no, I'm not confident. Maybe, maybe this one is not a lattice. I'm, I'm not 100% sure right now. So. Okay, thanks. But, so uh, essentially, yeah. so there's only two which are which have lots of symmetries, which have non-trivial rotational symmetries. Probably, I don't know. I did not did not think think of that. So maybe yeah, in principle, some configurations can have rotational symmetries and not be lattices. So lattices is more about translational symmetries. But, uh, 
Yeah, so here I'm not, not that confident. And so I, I imagine that some of this uh, uh, non-periodic configuration, well, not the periodic, but like not lattice configurations, they still could have maybe some uh, extra symmetries, but yeah, I'm not, not, not sure here. And so let me continue. So uh, now in dimension four, we have a, we don't know exact answer, but we have a good candidate. So this is, uh, this is what the number is supposed to be. And so this density is achieved by uh, D4 lattice. And this seems to be the unique candidate in dimension four. However, the uh, a question is still not solved yet. And so here, let me also write an upper bounds. So upper bounds. Here I write the upper bound, which is obtained by linear programming. And it's possible that in the literature, uh, this bound already has been improved. Uh, so here the uh, bound, uh, the linear LP bound was uh, zero six four seven so it's kind of on one hand maybe not too far away but on the other hand still there is still quite a gap between this value and the best and the linear programming bound and so now we also have dimensions uh, five six seven so i probably will not tell much about each of them, and I will not write down the, uh, the numbers, even though I prepared them on my, in my uh, notes, but maybe it's not so interesting. Maybe what is more interesting to say about this examples that uh, these dimensions, they're very similar to dimension three. So here in each of these dimensions, we have, uh, uh, so, so for, of course the only difference is that these cases are also not solved yet, but in all three cases, the most uh, feasible, the most somehow, it's widely believed that the uh, densest configurations are known. And here also we have so uncountably many candidates. And uh, that they are obtained by, they are so-called laminated packings. So this was the term invented by Sloan and Conway. And it means that each uh, packing is constructed from lower dimensional packings by putting them one on the top of, of another in, in, in such piles. And here situation is similar to, to dimension three in a sense that when, when we are putting one uh, layer on the top of another, we can do it in several different ways. And so here we had two different uh, possibilities, but for higher dimensions, Usually we have more possibilities. They have a quite nice combinatorial description. And also in each of these cases, we have uncountably many of these laminated lattices. So they are laminated, lattice, laminated configurations. And each of these class, three classes, so there are some of them which are not lattices and not periodic, but each of these classes, uh, contains at least one uh, lattice. So for example, for dimension five here, we have lattice D5. Here we will have lattice E6 and E7. So they all belong to this families of uncounted and laminated uh, configurations. Um, and so now uh, next to Next dimension is eight. And so this is the one uh, already uh, Sasha mentioned while introducing me. So in dimension eight, we again have uh, one very good candidate, which is the famous E8 lattice. Dimension eight. Uh, then in dimension eight, 
Uh, the, the best density will be this number by to the power of four divided by 384, which is about a quarter. And uh, this uh, density is achieved by the E8 lattice. And in 2016, I was able to show that indeed we cannot have any denser configuration in uh, dimension eight. And also if we have another periodic configuration which achieves this density, then it has to be uh, the E8 lattice. And in this case, actually linear programming bounds they do give us the exact, the, the exact bound or the sharp bound. And so now after dimension eight, we have dimension nine. And so here something uh, new and interesting happens what did not happen uh, in all previous dimensions. So here again, this case is unsolved yet. And in these cases, we have uh, candidates and they are described in a paper by uh, Conway and Sloan. So they, uh, so, so what they have found, they have found that in this dimension, there is a certain lattice I was noted by lambda nine. So it's a little lattice packing, which uh, achieve, possibly achieves uh, the best density. But what is interesting that also uh, Conway has found uh, uh, say, deformation of this lattice. So continuous deformation of this lattice, uh, which has the same density as a sphere packing. So he calls this construction, so a floating construction. So. Denote them by D9 theta plus. And so here theta is a certain continuous parameter which belongs in an interval. If I remember it correctly, interval is from 0, 1. And the idea is that this lattice, it, can, it has two, it can be divided, it has a sublet divided into two subsets. And so Conway calls them golden and silver balls. And then what he can do, he can, he could shift those silver balls. So he also leave the golden balls fixed and then all the silver balls, he could shift them by some vector. And the length of this vector was this number theta. And then uh, this new so configuration, it still was a sphere packing. And something like this, we did not have in the previous examples. In previous examples, we could have countably many uh, solutions, but we did not have a continuous family of uh, possible solutions. And then in dimension 10, also something like a new interesting phenomena happens is that in this uh, dimension, we have a configuration, uh, which is not a lattice configuration, and it is better than any known lattice. So it is so-called the best configuration. So, so it's called the, be uh, the best configuration named after mathematician whose surname was best. And this configuration, it's not a lattice. And uh, at the moment it is better than any known lattice in this dimension. But as I know somehow that there is no proof that it is, there is no lattice better than the best configuration. Is it a periodic configuration? Sorry? Is it I, a periodic I, configuration? I think so, yes. yes. So as I remember, it, it is a periodic configuration because you know, creating something non-periodic is just very difficult. It's difficult to think of something unperiodic. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the theorem you mentioned at the beginning, the fact that it's uh, achieved. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it uh, hard to show that it is achieved? What's the what's the nature of the proof to show that the densest packing? Yeah, so I think it is like an analysis uh, an analysis proof. So it, I think it's it's actually very constructive to yeah. It's it's constructive. Uh, more, 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 more or less. I, I think it's, it does not have any like special idea in it. It's just doing carefully analysis. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And so uh, then, somehow, I think after we have seen what happens in the dimension ten, then we somehow in other dimensions we have no more confidence, or at least I have no co more confidence in our computations. So. So, so in other now in other dimensions, uh, certain good configurations are known, and usually these configurations come from certain algebraic constructions. And uh, nor normally, the densities of all these configurations are very very far away from the uh, upper bounds. We can prove, and of course, we have no guarantee that there is no smart smarter construction. And also making some kind of exhaustive search by computer at this stage becomes quite uh, expensive. And so one here, maybe in this list, I would like to mention one more dimension, which is quite big. But in this big dimension, we have a very special configuration. So this here, in dimension 12, we have a leech lattice. Oh, sorry, no, dimension 24, we have a leech lattice. And so this lattice has this density, which seems like a really small number, even though for dimension 24, it's actually, it's very good. And so the density of leech lattice is in absolute terms bigger than the uh, best known uh, packing configuration in dimension 23. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is another uh, case which is already solved. So this is a theory a joint work together with uh, Henry Kohn, Abhinav Kumar, Danilo Ratchenko, uh, sorry, Stephen Miller and Danilo Ratchenko. We have shown in 2016, we have shown that the densest configuration in dimension 24 is the Lich, the configuration given by the Lich lattice. And also, if uh, there is another periodic configuration achieving the same density, then it has to be also the Lich lattice packing. And so now, my, one of my somehow favorite. Uh, research questions is now uh, what happens if dimension goes to infinity? Dimension goes to infinity. And as dimension goes to infinity, we have on one hand, we have the upper bounds and the best known asymptotic upper bar bound is the uh, bound obtained by Kapitansky and Levenstein. So, And so when dimension is big, this bound it uh, decays exponentially is in D uh, with this exponent, which is some uh, numerical value, uh, which is driven by asymptotics of uh, uh, the, thing, the first root of uh, uh, Gegenbauer. Uh, this, this number it reflects asymptotic behavior of the first root of Gegenbauer polynomial. Or certain or Jacobi polynomials with certain parameters depending on D. And so this is at the moment the best known upper bound, and it's already quite old. So it was obtained by Kabatansky and Levenstein. In 1978 which is quite long time ago. 
And since that time, the improvements have been only here in, in a constant term. So I think a few years ago, so this bound, the, the original bound, it was multiplied by, by a constant, I think by one half. And so another very interesting question is about, uh, so how can we construct very dense configurations? And constructing very dense configurations is actually, <clears throat> so on one hand, it's easy. It's very easy to construct a sphere packing with uh, density two to the minus uh, D. And so for example, this density is achieved just by a saturated packing. And I will, how it works, I will explain in a moment. So this is achieved by saturated packing. And now with some extra work, what we can do, we can also multiply this by D and by some constant. And so, so here they improve ones here, so they were made since just right. The people who contributed to first multiplying by D and then multiplying by the constant. So there are method by Minkowski, by Rogers. So this is 19th century. This uh, Rogers wrote his papers. Uh, in 1950s, then the five ball in he proved the following bound so that he proved what they this bound, which is already close here, but yeah, this constant C is just asymptotically one. And then Stephanie Vance found an improvement for also how I multiplied this number by another a bigger constant. And finally, the uh, Vinkatesh uh, the work of Stephanie Vance was in 2012, and the work of Vinkatesh was in 2013. So what Vinkatesh have done, he have made this constant in front of uh, the formula really big and also what he could do he could uh, so in a, in a certain subsequence of dimensions he could multiply uh, this bound by some function which is actually bigger than than constant which grows like log log d so here constant which is big say paper perfectly could achieve a rather big constant by considering uh, by studying uh, even unimodular lattices so, uh, and also he could uh, achieve a log of d in a subsequent of uh, di where di is some subsequence of dimensions And so what I would like to talk today, I would like to talk about this result of Venkatesh and how he obtained this log, log D uh, uh, result, because uh, this is a result that exploits the idea of symmetry. So he did so by considering certain symmetric sphere packings. And also I would like to talk about possible generalizations of uh, his construction. May I ask a question? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so the, these examples, this uncountable set of examples in dimension three that are produced using layers, I sort of envision it as uh, basically you're looking at, um, well, you're looking at digits, right? You're deciding which way you want to put the next layer. And so the way you get an uncountable set is basically by you have two choices here, the next layer you have two choices and so on. Mm -hmm. yes. So if you were to put an equivalence on such packings by saying, let's take a ball of finite radius, which is kind of like saying, let's only look at a finite number of digits, then they should all be equivalent. 
in that ball, or there, there should be a finite number of equivalence classes in that ball, right? Okay, but what I'm getting at is um, when you went to nine dimensions, you said that there was a continuity to it. So if you have that same sort of measure, there should still be an infinite number of, of examples all with the same density. Uh, yeah, so it was possible, it was possible to divide this packing uh, into like two sets of balls and then move these two sets like uh, both continuously with like respect to each other. Yeah, yeah. So that's very interesting. So there's a very different type of infinite, infinity uh, there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, may I also ask, uh, 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 yes. on Wikipedia, they mention a variation when spheres of two different kinds of radius are allowed. Do you know mm -hmm. if there are some results? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are results, and uh, I imagine most of them probably are. This probably a good problem, which is good for people uh, who are trying to approach it by computational methods, because uh, yeah, my many computational methods they would work also for for these uh, settings. Not that many things have to be changed, but yeah, and also I've obtained like few interesting results. I imagine many computational methods, or maybe also models like this being actually relevant for people doing physics or chemistry. Or mm -hmm. so I think they probably better studied from uh, by the applied community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. May I ask another question? Oh yes, yes. That example in, in in ten dimensions that you were talking about, can that one be modified to give an infinite set as well, or is it unique? Mm, here I'm not I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I think in the in the paper uh, of uh, Kohn and Sloan, it's given as an isolated construction. But uh, but I don't know how much time they gave it. They tried to somehow improve it or to find different configurations. I see. Okay. Uh, Thank but you. it seems to me that it's given like a, a unique and isolated thing, but no guarantee that there is nothing as good. So, so there was no obvious like sort of translation somewhere in there where you yeah. could or, or, share. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. If you're talking speaking of the obvious, uh, <laughs> I don't know. For me, other constructions they have, they also look quite unobvious. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. It's Thank you. I mean, that one is, uh, I just looked it up because I was uh, interested. It's from the 80s. It's from 1980, so it's 40 years old. Uh, yes, yes. And no one's yeah, found anything better. Um, probably, I mean, I think in this kind of problems, progress is not, sometimes is not that fast. It's, uh, also, the more it can happen that this thing is indeed the best and therefore there is no progress because there is nowhere to progress. Yeah. This is one possibility, of course. Another possibility is that, uh, I don't know, we are degrading and <laughs> people in the 80s did not have smartphones. They had all the times they wanted to solve math problems. And <laughs> we have to check, I don't know, emails 20 times a day. <laughs> it, it's already called the best, so. Yeah, so, yeah but, the, but the best, it's a, it's the last name of a person. Uh, yeah, house, so it's... Mark Best. Uh, and could I ask before you start, uh, maybe it's just a very naive idea, but did someone try to study like in bigger dimensions, which can be divided by eight or 24? I mean, some the sum of direct sum of leash lattices like in dimension 72, maybe it is possible to prove that three copies of leash lattice will be the densest or um, but you know, like usually in this kind of problem, usually taking direct uh, sums is bad somehow. It's, it's, not, like it's not efficient. Of, uh, usually not. You can think something about something like uh, the uh, lattice of integers. Like integers themselves, it's a wonderful packing, definitely the best, mm -hmm. no questions. But then if you take direct sums of, uh, uh, then you get Zn, and the packing configuration Zn is terrible. It's very bad. Mm -hmm. It's see, worse, worse, worse than exponentially bad. It's because you have to like, well, like you have to divide by n factorial somewhere, and yeah. And from this logic, of course, of course, if you had like very good configuration, you take its direct sum, it might be still not too bad. But normally, you lose a lot by 
considering these direct sums. So. And uh, what do you expect about uh, DN type lattices? Uh, can they be? I, th I think I think all of this like. Uh, all they are uh, somehow explain, uh, exponentially they are as bad as ZM. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this somehow there is certain like curse over this whole problem. So and it's somehow the, it happens that uh, sometimes people try to give explicit constructions for lattices like algebraic constructions. And what typical situation is that in small dimensions though construct those constructions work very well. Uh, for example, this lattice is constructed from elliptic curves or from some other algebraic objects. But then if, if we go, go to make take dimension to infinity, usually they are all somehow as bad as uh, Zn or maybe slightly better than Zn, but still super exponentially bad. So, and it's actually cool, took quite a lot till people could come up with this what's called like an explicit construction, which is only exponentially bad comparing to the random one. So. Is the intuition that you, you're wasting a lot of space already just trying to get a packing? So then putting two together, uh, you know, as a direct sum is, is not, not just for the integers, how it's bad for the integers, but uh, in general, how it would be bad because there's all this waste of space. This is how, maybe this is how Conway came up with this idea of laminated packing. Because like if you put them just on top, then you're wasting a lot of space. But you get some kind of like try to squeeze them and. Yeah, so this is how this laminated. You can imagine also for, for example, this. Uh, it's not again. Maybe it's like taking direct sum of like a two and z. If you take direct sum of a two and z, then you get a bad packing. So you need somehow to try to squeeze each of the push each of the layers slightly lower. And uh, when dimension is bad, then there will be a lot of space saved like this. Uh, however, it turns out that in, in very big dimensions, these laminated constructions are also not not very good. And there are better also. So at this point, some of the best ones are random. And yeah, so this is what I'm going to talk about now. So maybe I can start already. And so let me uh, first uh, tell, give you like an easy way how to construct good packings. And so it turns out that somehow greedy packings are good packings. So I will say that uh, packing P is saturated if we cannot add a single new ball to this packing. If we take Taking P and try to add even one uh, intersected with any ball of radius one, and we will always get a non empty intersection. So it means that we cannot add this ball to our packing and get a new, new packing. So, and this will be true for all points in R. And so now, and rather easy theorem, or maybe I can call it a lemma. It tells us that if P is saturated, uh, then the density of P is at least two to the minus D. And so now why this happens, Because we see that if our P is union of or some axis is separated, then if we take the union of balls with the same centers and reduce our make the take them radius two now. So now such a union of balls, it has to cover all the Euclidean space. And this is true because if it does not cover all Euclidean space, then we would have some point where we can put a new center for a ball, for a new ball and add a new ball to P. 
And so, but now we see that uh, somehow locally, when we are making all our balls twice bigger, we are multiplying their volume by two to the power D. And two to the power D, this gives us somehow the whole volume. Uh, so now we have to play a little bit uh, with this uh, intersection of these configurations with really big ball to make everything uh, rigorous. But uh, so I will skip those uh, steps. And I'll just try to, from, from here, we can see that the density of P has to be at least two to the minus P. So you see that getting uh, two to the minus D is actually very easy. And now what we will have to uh, work hard for is for D times uh, log log D. So this is what requires a lot of work. And so, uh, but before we come to that, so let me give you another way how to obtain uh, also packing of density two to the minus D. But uh, this time we will speak not about uh, uh, any packing, but about lattice packing. So how to obtain lattice packing of this dimension. So here the theorem. So, and this theorem, it was somehow goes back to Minkowski, then also Klavka gave a so this is 19th century, then Klavka worked at the beginning of 20th century and gave some like, a different proof of the same theorem. And then the same method was uh, uh, somehow okay. So the idea of Minkowski was rewritten by Rogers only in a more modern uh, language. Uh, and so the theorem tells us is that uh, the sphere, the, uh, the sphere packing constant, so we'll, the delta D was the sphere packing constant, let's denote by delta D lattice, the supremum of the uh, packing densities over all lattice packings. So the, this is also at least two to the minus D. And so if in, in the case of packings, we could obtain uh, the, the, this reasonably dense packing by applying a greedy algorithm. So for lattices, what we will do, we will show that a random lattice has a, a, at least uh, this density. And so to do this, what we have to do, we have to define what is a random lattice for us. And so, so for this, we will have to define the space of uh, lattices. And so let's consider the group SL2 R or oh, SLD R. So it's a group of uh, D by D matrices with determinant one. So and so inside of so this is a group and inside of this group we have a, first we have a discrete subgroup sldz so this is the a group of all matrices with integer coefficients and uh, determinant one. And also another important thing we have, uh, so on this group, we have a harm measure. So it's measure which is invariant under uh, right and left multiplication. So mu would be the harm measure. But for us only the right multiplication will be important. So. And so now we can define our space to be a quotient and so 
uh, uh, what happens is that first this the volume of if we compute the power measure of uh, uh, this quotient so now it will be uh, finite and so we can normalize our power measure so that uh, this measure is actually one And so now we can see. Uh, okay, so I think here I did something wrong. Uh, so now we have to see why is this uh, the. So now this will be our space of uh, random lattices. So now how do we? Uh, so we have if we have some element in uh, this uh, space. Then we will associate to it the following lattice. This will be uh, the set of uh, G acted on all vectors L, where L is a vector with integer coordinates. So then for each element G in this set, uh, lambda G, it will be a lattice. Of co volume one in the Euclidean space RD. And so now uh, we will have to use uh, one fact which is called the uh, Ziegel mean value theorem. Now let f be a function on the dimensional Euclidean space, and we suppose that this function is measurable and that it has compact support. And so now, uh, uh, what the Ziegel mean value theorem tells us, it tells us how to compute. Uh, so now, what we are doing, we are taking uh, uh, some over some lattice of our functions. Oh, okay, and the only thing we want to do, we are now taking some over lattice without zero. Zero, we are throwing away. Uh, so we are taking this uh, sum over uh, lattice without zero. Now what we want to do? Now we want to change our lattice here uh, to be an element of this uh, uh, space with measure. And we want to compute this average value. So now our lattice, it will depend on this element G and G will live in this uh, quotient space. And we will integrate this with respect to the power measure on, on G. And so now the Ziegler mean value theorem tells us that uh, such an integral, such an average, average sum of our uh, function over a lattice will be the same as the integral of this function over the whole Euclidean space. And so, and so this is a result which was somehow known to uh, Minkowski and described by Minkowski in his own uh, term, in the terms of the, in the language of his time, uh, but then also written down by uh, Ziegel in a much more modern form. And so now we are going to use this theorem to prove uh, 
the existence of dense letting, lattice packings. So now we have to, what we have to do, we have to choose an appropriate function f. And so now, so, so we are fixing a choose take a real number r, positive number r such that the radius or the ball of radius r uh, uh, will be a ball of, of volume one minus epsilon. So here, okay, so let's first, uh, what we have to do, we have to fix small positive number epsilon. And we choose a number r such that the ball of radius r will have volume one minus epsilon. And so now we can apply, uh, now we apply Ziegel mean value theorem. The following function. would be the indicator function of this ball. So it would be one if x is in a ball. And it will be zero otherwise. And so now we see that uh, by uh, uh, Ziegler mean value theorem, the average of uh, the sum of such a function over, over all lattices, it will be equal to the integral of this function over Euclidean space, which is just the volume of this ball. And we know that we uh, can always have some element G such that this sum associated to this element G will be smaller or equal than the average. So it means that there is G in this space term AG, such that the sum over latest lambda G smaller than uh, one minus epsilon. Uh, but now uh, we know that uh, our function, it was an indicator function. And so if its value is smaller than one, then it has to be zero. And if it is zero, uh, this will mean that uh, our uh, lattice uh, will be a, a <clears throat> uh, will give us a good packing configuration. So our lattice it has point density one, and we can take those centers and put in those centers uh, balls of radius r divided by two, and we will obtain a sphere packing. So this would be square uh, packing so with a center density one and volume density of this packing uh, would be so and the density is originally. So defined, it would be one minus epsilon times uh, two to the minus d. And so we again obtained two to the minus d. And so it seems like now we have done something much more complicated and obtained result, which is uh, with this epsilon, it looks even slightly worse. Uh, or in the best case is the same. So maybe one thing I want to tell you is that indeed, actually here we, we did gain something new and that's uh, because here we could easily replace this one by two. 
And then if this sum is actually smaller than two, then we know that it is also zero. And that's because in each lattice, we always have a, a vector and minus vector is contained. And so here we could have minus D plus one. So we did gain a little bit. So at least we gained the factor of two. And so, uh, but now I would, I would like to do, to say that uh, this same idea can, so here we use the, the fact that each uh, lattice, it has a semi symmetry uh, by multiplication by minus one. So it's centrally symmetric, uh, but we can actually push this idea further. And so this is what uh, first uh, Stephanie Vance did and then uh, Venkatesh, uh, some uh, did as well. So what we can do now, but we can, we can consider again, random lattices, but we can consider random lattices with symmetries. And uh, the kind of symmetry was the symmetry of uh, uh, cyclotomic fields. So but what I will be writing now, so this is the uh, theorem proved by Ben Katesh in 2013. And so the proof goes as follows. So let K, so let, Psi be a uh, u, 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 root of unity. So it would be a complex number. And we consider the cyclotomic field. So this would be the field of rationals adjoined with root, the primitive root of unity. And we know that this uh, will be a number field and its degree over Q would be equal to the phi of N. So this is the number of the Euler's totian function of N, which is the number of classes modulo. And which are co prime with and so in this number field we have its ring of integers. And what will be important for us is that in the ring of integers, of course, we have uh, the group of uh, roots of unity. And it's roots of unity. Subgroup inside the uh, group of units of uh, this ring. And so now what we can do, also an important thing which we have, we have a complex, so our field is totally uh, imaginary. So we have uh, by over n over two complex embeddings of our field. And so here, uh, the, this all embeddings, they are, uh, for, for, for each embedding, of course, we also have its uh, complex conjugate. And, but among this phi n for phi phi n, we don't have any pair of uh, embeddings which are complex conjugate to each other. So from each pair, we are choosing only, only one. And so now we have a standard embedding of our field into, complex uh, space of dimension phi over n divided by two. And so this number we will note it by D. And so this embedding works in the following way. So if we take a number X in the field, then we map it into the vector of 
this complex consisting of this complex embeddings of this number. And so here, this uh, complex, uh, uh, the dimensional complex uh, space, we will uh, identify it with the Euclidean space of dimension 2D, and the Euclidean norm will so Euclidean norm. Uh, just that we have a vector. Psi which is equal to psi one and D. And the norm of psi squared it will be just sum of the norms of its absolute values of its coordinate square. And so now what our goal is, it's to, uh, and of, of course, what is also true is that now our uh, group of uh, cyclotomic units, it will be also acting on this space. So first is that, we, of course, we can embed our ring of integers in this way into this space, and we will get a lattice. And uh, also the roots of unity, they will also act on this space. So now we have O is embedded into this space D. And now U N, it also acts on this space. And now what we want to do, we want to create a, a certain a space of lattices. Uh, so which will be, which will have this symmetry. What we want is some space of lattices. With this mu and symmetry. And it also should also what we want uh, another condition, we want to have an analog of a Ziegelian value theorem. is uh, supposed to be true for this particular space of lattices. And so, how do we do this? So for this, uh, uh, we have to do a compromise. It turns out that it will, will be very difficult or maybe even impossible to do this in dimension D. Uh, so we have to go to the dimension at least twice higher. So we have to consider a space of dimension twice bigger. So this is a construction by uh, Venkatesh. So he considered a um, space. So he considered uh, his um, tokens. So we will work in this space. A space which uh, has a morphy to the C, CD times with the same Euclidean uh, norm which we have already defined before. And so uh, Uh, so now we will see that this group will consider the group of two by two uh, complex matrices with determinant two, with determinant uh, one, and raise this group to the power d. And now this group will be acting on this uh, space. Here, maybe it may be more convenient to write it down as. C2 to the power to the power D. And 
And so now what we can do, we can embed our uh, two copies of our uh, ring of integers into this space. So here if we take numbers and one and, and two in the ring, then they will be and a and B. Inside of this uh, uh, group, uh, we will have a discrete subgroup which fixes our, uh, which fixes uh, this uh, lattice. And so this would be the group. So now I said to O. Now it, uh, of course, it, uh, it acts on two, and we can think of this SL to O as embedded into and so now the space of. Uh, Lattices, which we consider to look like this. So we'll have this space. And so it turns out that here now again, like our lattice, which corresponds to element G. So this would be uh, G acted on. And we uh, choose a car measure. This can be normalized. So I've said the car measure of lambda B would be uh, lambda. Uh, and it turns out that for uh, in these settings we also have a Ziegelmin value theorem. It's still true. So. And so here, when we are taking uh, integral, we are taking it with respect to the standard uh, volume form associated to the Euclidean norm, which we have defined on this space. So can I ask, in this setting, it seems like he really is taking O and placing it against itself in exactly the way that we were saying wouldn't be optimal. But it's, he has to take a second moment. Uh, yes, yes, but that's, again, but that's because we have to, uh, satisfy all these conditions. So indeed, somehow here I want to gain something, but uh, we, we, some, because of all of the constraints of this construction, we have to pay the price. Mm -hmm. That's actually what we're doing. So we are taking the product, but then we're also somehow rotating each of them. So we, like, we have to these two products, but we also have uh, uh, this group that actually acts somehow be, be placed between these two, like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, two, mm. S slices or something. Or two, 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 two parts of our product, yes. Okay, thanks. The last 
important thing of this construction is that. Uh, Sorry, can I ask another stupid question? The Ziegel mean value theorem, it's, it's just unfolding, is it not? Sorry? Did the Ziegel mean value theorem, you just unfold the, the sum and the integral? Oh, okay. So it's not that easy than that. So here, in, in principle, yes, you unfold, but then there is, of course, a question of uh, convergence. And because all these spaces, they usually have cusps. Uh, so there is a, somehow, I think if you are a person with analytic mind, you would have to do all this work or maybe find some magic trick how, how to avoid doing hard work and to, yeah. Thanks. At least the way, the way Ziegel does it, he does spend a lot of time on actually uh, showing that an analysis work well and that the sums are indeed convergent and that the volume is finite. So this is certain work and then generalizing it to other groups, it's also, it's also work. Now, like, luckily for us, this, lots of this work has already been done before by people like Ziegel himself and then by Borel for other groups, but uh, that's not, no, no, not, no, not very easy. And so, uh, so the Ziegel mean value theorem works in this case. And uh, another important aspect is that now this group mu n, it acts on, on our lattices lambda g uh, diagonally. Okay, so one is okay. so we have to we have this natural action action of mu n on this space c to the power uh, d, and then the space we are working on now uh, is that we're now of course is c d. And here now we consider the, this action to be uh, inherited by this one, so it's simply acting on each component. So uh, yeah. di diagonal action on each of the com components. And so now if we had some vector V in uh, this lattice, which we have just constructed and uh, Zeta be an element of our uh, roots of unity, then the action of zeta on V will be again an element of lambda G. So this is what is what is important. And what is also important is that uh, because our group is a, a site, so this action of uh, uh, mu n on uh, our space, it's a, a free action. It doesn't have any fixed points except for, except for zero. And so it means that each orbit, it will have uh, n points. So if it's, so if uh, V is a, a non-zero vector, then the size of And so now we are ready again to use uh, our uh, Ziegel mean value theorem. So this time what we do now, we uh, again fix epsilon number. And so we now we let R be a real number, real positive number such that the ball of radius R in the space of dimension 2D has volume, which is the size of UN minus epsilon, which is again the N minus epsilon. And so now we apply Ziegel mean value theorem. to the function 
Is that phi of n minus epsilon? Sorry? The number of elements in mu of n is phi of n? No, no, no. Number of elements in mu of n is n. Is n. Okay, but all n, not primitive n three two. All n three two unity. Okay. So the, the degree of uh, of a field k over q that's phi of n. Okay, so here we will take indicator of this particular ball. And so now what we see is that now there exists. G in our space and n such that uh, this sum over uh, G O squared of the radius of indicator functions equals to the smaller or equal to the mu n minus epsilon. And now we know if it is smaller or equal than mu n minus epsilon, then we know that it has to be zero. So here's one more important uh, aspect which I did not say. So I told that each point, each point has at least n points in its orbit, and also that uh, uh, we know that uh, mu n, the action of mu n respects uh, the scale of the absolute the Euclidean norm we, we have chosen. And so if we have uh, one point inside of a ball, then all its Euclidean orbit also will be inside of the ball. So. Uh, and so at this point, uh, we know that what we have done, we, now we see that for this particular G, this, this latest lambda G, which is G times O squared, so gives us a, gives us a pecking with the following density. So this density will be at least uh, the number of elements in mu n. So I, uh, I forget about epsilon because we can take epsilon as small as we want, times two to the minus four d. And that's because the real dimension of our space will be now four d. Uh, what that taking? Yes, and, and our. Um, so now what we can, how we can summarize this is that now We see that uh, uh, delta of four D has to be bigger or equal than the n times two to the minus four D, or in other words, we can write is the delta of two pi of n is bigger or equal than n times 2 minus 2 pi of n. Four, but it's 2 times 5. And so now we see that we obtained this uh, uh, this term here, and which will asymptotically it will grow like some constants times log log of 
So yes, yeah, so what I should say that for now, what we can do, we can choose this n to be if our n is a product of many distinct small primes. Uh, then if we are comparing n against phi of n, then it will grow like, like this. So we have obtained this non-constant win. What we wanted to get uh, is well, the dis disadvantage, of course, is that uh, we obtained it not for all dimensions, but for uh, some rather strange arithmetically defined subsequence of dimensions. And maybe the last thing I would like to say is that uh, uh, so well, uh, PhD student uh, in my group, uh, Nihar Gargava, he generalized the method of Vinkatesh to work also with the other division algebras. So not only with uh, cyclotomic fields, but with uh, uh, division algebras. And so he's, here's the theorem. Let D be a finite dimensional division algebra over Q. And we suppose that O is some order in this. Division algebra and G is a finite subgroup then we will put the number D to be two times the dimension of D over Q And in this case, delta D would be bigger or equal than the size of G0 times 2 to the minus. D. And so here in this theory, well, this year, and there are some uh, good news and bad news. So good news is that it uh, generalizes the result of Vinkatesh. And for example, this way we obtain this existence results for some dimensions for which uh, the method of Medipin-Katesh does not work. On the other hand, asymptotically, uh, the uh, Likars two could not beat uh, this. Uh, okay, so this this sequence. So this sequence still seems, seems to be the best even though the theorem allows us for more flex, flexi, a bit more flexibility. Uh, but uh, so actually the groups G0 like this, they're actually classified. They're called Amitsur groups. And so there are not only, so for example, like a cyclic group, of course, will uh, fall into this category, but they're not only cyclic groups. There are some more classes, but not too much. And for each of these classes, it seems that uh, uh, what Nihar could get is was rather uh, so this, uh, improvement of the what looked like uh, log log of the dimension times to some constant where a constant was smaller than one, some explicit constant like 724 second. So, yeah, so this is all I wanted to, to tell you. And maybe maybe the last thing is that I still think that like this problem of uh, proving existence results for uh, sphere packings it's a very ex exciting topic and you see little has been done since Minkowski so yeah, maybe maybe it's, it seems like it's something exciting to to work on and to maybe this is where we need more ideas. All right, thank you for your beautiful talk. It was very interesting. Um, if there are any questions, please ask. 
we, we can first just thank Marina. Yeah, yeah. sure. That's a close first. Any questions? I, I have a question or comment. Perhaps one can try a mixture of division algebra and number field, like you take a division algebra over a number field, mm. which is pretty natural object, you know? Mm, yes, yes, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yes, there are many things to, to try here. So we hope, <laughs> we hope that we, maybe we can squeeze something more out of this. It uh, could be yeah. because you have more freedom. Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask a really stupid question? So, um, I mean, there's the theorem, but has anyone tried to turn this idea into an actual, like in dimension 10? So phi of 11 is 10. Has anyone tried to beat bests packing by this just numerically? I, 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 I imagine that they did and probably, probably I mean, for example, when I, yeah, when, when uh, Nikar worked on this project, so he wrote like a bunch of programs which compute these numbers in different dimensions and compared them to, so I'm sure if, if it could be something in dimension 11, then he, he would get a I good see. Okay. result. But pro pro probably it does not really work. So pro probably it does not give, give, give very good result. Uh, because so then Gitesh is asymptotic. Yeah, Sorry? so like I think uh, so usually all the, this kind of constructions they look uh, uh, so what, what happens here that some of these algebraic constructions uh, they can work in very small dimensions uh, and uh, then usually they somehow become uh, so it's all the matter of scale so to say. Uh, so, so, uh, they think in, in very small dimensions, usually by hand, people have already constructed something better. And uh, then it's in like in if dimension is, I don't know, maybe up to 100 or 300, then maybe computer can find something by some kind of like, or gradient descent or random search. And it's hard to beat that theoretically. And then when dimension becomes like, I don't know, maybe a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, this is when some methods like this, they turn to be the best. And also, yeah, also what often happens to some like much smarter algebraic, so this is like random algebraic constructions. And there are also explicit algebraic constructions. And very often those are somehow good in a certain range of dimensions, like between, I don't know, hundreds and 200, they might be this kind of random argument, but then eventually they become super exponentially bad and this still stays good, so it's, uh, yeah. But I think 10 is very small dimension, so in, in this kind of very small dimensions, uh, some, other, some other probably best construction would be, would be better. Thanks. And your technique in dimensions eight and 24, it used uh, modular forms and was it, was it also applied to Ziegel theorem or it was very different? No, but okay, well, what I to, to, to was presenting today was about bounds from another side. So the bounds <laughs> I proved in dimension eight and 24, they are upper bounds and these are lower bounds. And uh, yeah, so that, that kind of technique, I don't know, pro probably does not work here. <laughs> I mean, you can never say, yeah, never say never. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. Like they're not being smart enough to apply them. So. Yeah, actually, yeah, uh, idea something uh, to use uh, quaternionic uh, division algebras. It comes from arithmetic groups. Uh, it's partially related to yeah hyperbolic geometry and uh, SL to Z and so on and stuff. So yeah, maybe so, so it's yeah, a little. They do come up in this uh, formalism, call it like this. And actually, so Stephanie Vance, she used in, in her construction. She did use quaternionic uh, groups to, to to obtain her. Uh, Improvement. Are there some analogous re results for hyperbolic spaces? Yeah, for example, analogous to your eight dimension eight and dimension twenty-four. So, in, in particular, you have two hundred forty generators, which corresponds to canonical polyhedron in in, in hyperbolic dimension eight. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of reflection group in in right angle for polyhedron. Uh, yes, I'm sure that there are, there are many, many connections. 
but uh, yeah, maybe maybe it's maybe then it's important to be like more I don't know, yeah, more pre, pre, precise precise precise. So I I, feel, I think actually uh, so Sasha Kolpakov he had some results about yeah I saw it I, I saw it space yes, yes. and probably he knows better than I know how to work in there and yeah. I see. Perhaps Winberg's chapter in Conway's Law and Book mm. tells something about the connections. Uh, so yes. Winberg wrote a chapter in, oh. in the book about, uh, about the sphere packings. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it's quite elementary. I saw it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you want it to be non elementary? <laughs> no, I don't know, but I think in, in this area, like, I know, it seems like in this area progress happens somehow slowly. And yeah, so many, many ideas are somehow elementary. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Great. Any, any other questions so far? If no one has questions, so let's, let's uh, thank Brain again. Yeah, great, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, really lovely Thank stuff. You. It was a great talk. And I think this is uh, the last talk this semester. We are going to continue next semester and uh, the dates are to be determined. They will be announced ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely not Thank after you. the fact. Yeah, great way to, uh, to end the semester. Thank you, Marianne. Really yeah. beautiful. So, goodbye. Okay. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye. See you all next time. Yeah. See you next year. See you next year.